Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my thoughts on the 2021 streaming series, Them. Now, before I get around to sharing more of my thoughts on this show, I want to give a special shout out to Isaiah for requesting this video. If there is another show, film, or topic you'd like to see me discuss in the future, feel free to donate to my PayPal. The link will be in the video description down below. Now, as you can see, this is a part of my Thoughts On series where I provide more condensed, more to the point uh, viewpoints on a particular piece of media. And the reason why I decided to do that with them is because it's a show that deals with a lot of heavy subject matter, so I didn't really want to go super in-depth on things. But at the same time, I just felt like this was the best setup for uh, my thoughts on this series. Because it's not like a traditional TV show where each episode is its own separate story. It's a show where everything is connected. So all the arcs are connected into one major arc. So in a lot of ways, it's like a short film or a short story that's adapted into a miniseries with different chapters. So I feel the best way to talk about it is to talk about the series as a whole. Now, before I get into sharing my pros and my cons of them and my ultimate uh, final verdict on the series, I, I want to uh, provide a little bit of perspective about what this show is for those of you that aren't familiar with it. So, Them is a 2021 streaming series that debuted on Amazon Prime Video earlier in 2021, and... It's a horror drama anthology show. It's definitely inspired by uh, other horror anthology shows that have a season that's compromised of 10 episodes or at least around 10 episodes that combine together into one story. And it's created by uh, a uh, writer named um, Little Marvin. And it features a cast that's compromised of Deborah Orinde as Livia, Lucky Emery, uh, Ashley Thomas as Henry, uh, uh, Allison Pill as Betty, Shahadi White Wright uh, Joseph as Ruby, uh, Melody Hurd as Gracie, uh, Ryan Quantin as George Bell. Uh, so it focuses on the Emery family and uh, the trials and tribulations that they face. Uh, when they decide to move from North Carolina to Compton in California uh, during the 1950s. And they deal with uh, horrors that involve uh, real life or uh, human horrors with people being racist in the neighborhood and wanting them out of there. But they also at the same time are dealing dealing with supernatural horrors that also uh, threaten to tear them apart and want to uh, remove them from uh, their dream home. And the setting of this series, I would say, is one of the first pros that I can think of. I think that the overall setting and premise of this show is a, a net positive. I like the fact that it takes place in Compton uh, because it's a different perspective of that neighborhood that you don't see much of in media. So I, I think that choice was rather inspired. On top of that, I think that having it take place in the 50s, even though it, it represents a lot of discussions, a lot of themes that have been done before and arguably done better in other forms of media, it's still a setting that creates a nice contrast for the supernatural horror and also for the human horror that's present in this series. Because you have this whole uh, leave it to beaver uh, idyllic landscape and you get to show the seedy underbelly of that. So I, so I feel that that's uh, definitely something that uh, works. And when it comes to other uh, positives, I, I think that some of the subtext is, is actually rather in interesting, uh, in particular how it takes uh, a racist caricature of a 
tap dancing uh, Sambo with a, a blackface and turns this character into some kind of force and entity that's trying to make Henry Emery uh, be the very stereotypical image of an Af African American that the racists around him think he should be. Like, I think that's really an interesting dynamic to have this racist caricature and that's known for being uh, a stereotype and having it try to manipulate Henry to the point where he's becoming uh, the stereotype that uh, a lot of people view him as. So I think that's a really interesting uh, uh, thing that's going on within the... Uh, the story. I think it's some nice subtext. Uh, I also think the subtext involving Ruby Lee's character and this ghost girl that's manipulating her into thinking that she should be white and that her life would be better if she is white. I think that's also uh, some nice subtext. It creates a, an interesting dialogue and something that definitely a lot of African Americans faced back in the 50s and in some ways still face today. This idea that they are ashamed of their blackness. They they feel like they should be white. They should be lighter skin uh, because then maybe they would be uh, happier or things would be better for them. So I, I think that there is some interesting and genuinely uh, compelling arguments and discussions that can be had about that topic. So that is kind of a con, though, with the subtext, because to me, it's 50-50. It's like some of the subtext is handled well, like the ones that I mentioned here, but then the others aren't really as effective. And so that's a little disappointing. Uh, but yeah, I would say the subtext uh, when it comes to those kind of things, uh, at least the ones that I mentioned is actually pretty strong. Now, speaking of strong things, I think the supernatural elements when they are there are definitely creepy. They are eerie. They are atmospheric and moody. That's what makes it so disappointing that they seem to be put on the back burner for the repetitive and honestly pretty dull uh narrative involving the racist neighborhood it's just one of those things like that's been done a ton of times and other bits of media and prose and the supernatural stuff in this kind of environment is not as common so i would have liked to have seen more of that more of a focus on the on the horror instead of the human horror, even though the human horror at times is very uh, uh, intense and, and very horrifying in its own right. I, I feel that the supernatural horror, though, provides more uh, interesting stuff, like the, the entities that are uh, using different forms to manipulate this family. Speaking of the supernatural, I think for the most part, the, uh, the finale the uh, triumph that the Emery family ultimately has over their supernatural demons, uh, I think is quite uh, strong. Uh, I think there are some issues with it. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I don't like the reveal of the tap dance man just being some white racist uh, ghost. That's all it is. It's just a white guy who died and then decided to uh, torment the... Uh, the Emery family uh, and use the guise of a racist caricature. It, it, it's just something that I don't think needed to be explained that way. I think it's more compelling and more powerful and more intriguing if it's never explained and you don't even know uh, what the ident identity is of uh, the, the tap dance man because what does that really offer the reveal? That it's just a white guy. Like, it, it feels like a Scooby-Doo episode. It was Mr. Withers the entire time. I would have to admit the whole stuff with uh, Ruby Lee and the ghost girl. The way that ghost girl gets her comeuppance is just kind of eh. But other than that, I, I really like how Miss Vera gets it. She gets torn apart into pieces. And it's a really... Uh, crowd-pleasing moment because the way that 
uh, the series shows this character get ripped apart is uh, quite uh, effective in terms of the visuals. And I thought it was a cool looking effect. And even with the, the tap dance man, he gets shot in the head prior to the reveal, which was not necessary. Just shoot him in the head and then he disappears. We don't need to have it be uh, revealed that it was uh, Mr. Withers the entire time. Uh, the whole thing with the man in the black hat, really uh, uh, effective stuff as well because uh, he gets sent to hell and finally gets to pay for uh, his deal with the devil. I do feel that for the most part, this is a series that has some high production values. There definitely is a budget behind it. I think the production design and art direction is fantastic. I, I feel everyone involved did a remarkable job recreating the look and the aesthetic of the 1950s and this uh, suburban, idyllic, leave it to beaver uh, landscape, as well as the other more uh, creepy, disturbing aspects of uh, the series. And... Speaking of the creepy, disturbing aspects, I think those have some really striking visuals. Uh, and I think overall, this is a series that has some nice shots. And I would say from a technical standpoint, it's pretty much top of the line. From the directing to the cinematography to the editing. Uh, there are some times with the directing where I think it's a little bit off. Like I personally would have liked to have seen less lens flares or less bloom effects. But that's just me personally. But really, uh, at the end of the day, it's a solid series when it comes to its technical levels and of course the performances the performances by the main cast are phenomenal i mean uh, deborah ararinde as lucky it's a really strong really compelling really layered performance it was very uh uh difficult to pull off because of all the different kinds of emotions that uh the actress had to portray on the screen believably and i i feel that uh, deborah did a dynamic and just amazing job doing that uh she completely excelled uh in that role uh ashley thomas uh, i also felt he was amazing as henry another role that had a lot of different layers to it a lot of different uh, sides uh, of the character that he had to showcase and he did that very well um I also want to give a lot of uh, praise to the rest of the Emory family. Uh, Shahadi Wright Joseph as Ruby, another very complicated, uh, very uh, uh, strong performance. And by complicated, I mean it's a complex performance. There's different uh, uh, structures within it. And I, and I feel that she did a, a great job showing vulnerability, showing strength, showing a lot of different sides to her character as well. And Gracie Emery, she was fine too. Uh, Melody Hurd, uh, I, I felt that the performance uh, wasn't as uh, noteworthy because the, the younger daughter wasn't given as much to do. But she still uh, held her own quite well. Uh, and uh, Allison Pill, at times she was chewing the scenery a little bit too much as uh, Betty, but uh, she played a great antagonist, a great human antagonist. Like, you hated this woman. Like, you wanted her to get her comeuppance, and it, it created some really strong scenes. Like, when uh, Lucky finally confronts her and slaps her in the face, it's a crowd pleasing moment. Um,. So she definitely relished the opportunity to play such a villainous, vile, racist bitch. And uh, that goes a long way. She was not at all uh, sugarcoating things or uh, playing with kids' gloves when it comes to this character. And I also felt Ryan Quantin also did a, a solid job as George Bell, this milkman who's infatuated with Betty, who has this darker, more sinister side uh, that he's hiding from everyone else that he eventually reveals later on in the series. 
I also want to mention uh, uh, Pat Healy as Marty Dixon. I thought the guy did a really great job playing a despicable piece of shit character. Uh, and this is a guy who is the kind of scumbag that you want to see get his ass beat in and by ass not not beat up his ass beat in his asshole beat in so far uh into his body it comes out his fucking mouth so i gotta give the the actor a lot of credit for making that guy so fucking despicable and, and uh unlikable and yeah i would it's it's a series that has a lot of merits that's why I don't think it's the worst thing, and that's why I don't hate the series, but I still don't like it. It's a firmly below average series for me because of the fact that the writing is just so subpar and so uh, poor in terms of its consistency of quality. Uh, yeah, one of the, the, the first con that comes to mind is that the writing is consistently below average the narrative feels like it's too stretched out to the point where it's way too thin there's no reason for this to be 10 episodes it should have been a two hour long movie and then that was it because there's not enough meat on the bone there's not enough compelling storytelling there's not enough characterization there's not enough things to justify the extended amount of time that you're spending with this series and there are some subplots and arcs that aren't given enough attention. And then there's ones that really don't work very well. For instance, with Betty, there's this whole reveal that the, the man that she thinks that she could trust is actually some kind of creep who kidnaps her and keeps her in a silo. And he eventually decides to let her go. But it's a it's a it's a trap because she gets shot in the back and left for dead in the middle of a field in the middle of fucking nowhere. And I I, I appreciate the, the fact they're trying to do something a little different here with her uh, denouement, but it's not satisfying at all because early on in this series, this character is built up as being this white uh, boogeyman in a lot of ways, or boogie woman, this white boogie woman. Uh, and... You hate this fucking character. You want to see her get her comeuppance. And you want to see her get her comeuppance at the hands of Lucky. Or the Emery family. You don't want to see it happen the way that it does. It's not as satisfying the slightest to see her get shot in the back. And left for dead in a field. It's not satisfying. And it feels like your time is wasted. Because you're not given the uh the the ending that you feel that this character deserved that you feel that this character really needed in order to learn some kind of lesson what's her lesson to not trust anybody e even even uh white people it, it's it's like okay that's not really that great of a lesson to me it should have been one of those things where she cracks she cracks be uh, under the pressure of not being able to force this family out and uh, she just completely has a mental breakdown loses it goes to the point where she's actually physically uh trying to harm or attack the emory family and that leads to lucky or henry defending themselves in self-defense i think that would be a better way to take that character out instead of taking her out with a shot in the back in the middle of, of fucking nowhere and there are some other things too, like the ghost girl. I don't even remember how that character was subdued uh, at the end of the series. Uh, there's other things too, like for instance, uh, the Miss Vera subplot with, uh, with Gracie. It's not really handled that well. It, it feels like it's half-baked. There's something about... Uh, how uh, Gracie has lost respect or, or trust of her mother, and so she's looking for another teacher. And, and, and there's something involving that, but it just didn't really translate that well. But the worst, the worst, exam the worst instance of a arc that is handled 
terribly is the origin of the man in the black hat. So there's this man in a black hat who's a sinister figure that's always hovering around Lucky and tormenting her and her family. And he's a, a reverend in a, in, a, in a black preacher hat. And uh, the character it was portrayed by Christopher Hyredal. And this is a character that's given in an entire episode that's shot in black and white that provides his backstory. And this, the writing in this episode is so fucking awful. It's one of those instances where the writers clearly were running out of steam, running out of ideas. So they were like, okay, we need to have something, need to have things last uh, 10 episodes. Uh, let's throw this episode in there with the man in the black hat and provide his origin where he's a reverend uh, in a small town and a community. He does the right thing, the godly thing, and let's say uh, African-American couple into his good graces and into the community. And after he saves this boy, which turns out to be the devil, he starts to be corrupted by the devil. And so does the rest of his community. And they turn against the African-American couple. And they... Uh, turn against them to the extreme. I mean, they tie them up, they burn their eyes out with red-hot fire pokers, and they lynch them. This causes the community to then catch on fire, and then before the reverend is about to die, the devil, the, the boy that he rescued, makes him a deal. The devil says, if you... Uh, do my bidding and you try to corrupt and take as many black souls as you can to hell, I will make you more and more powerful. But if you fail to take one soul to hell, one black soul, I will send you to hell. And he agrees to do it because he wants power. And then the whole, everything that's the way that it's all set up feels like it's very forced. Like they're going a fast forward. Like why would this character be so obsessed with power uh, ultimate power and it also makes the terribly tone deaf decision to write the explanation for why this character is racist and why the community is racist as the devil made him do it the devil made them racist are you fucking kidding me like how how the hell do you not realize after thinking about that for like five seconds that that's problematic oh he's not racist he 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 let them into his community and, and was being nice to them but then he uh run it ran into the devil in the form of this kid and the devil devil corrupted him and the devil made him racist your main supernatural antagonist has a get out of racism free card despicable like abhorrent fucking writing like what the fuck were you thinking you take racism and make it trivialized in such a fashion i i'm i'm 100 with all the critics that were against the writing in this episode because it's fucking tone deaf and it's fucking stupid and speaking of tone deaf there's another really important scene or sequence in this series that is equally as tone deaf to me the cat in the bag scene for those of you who haven't seen the series uh cat in the bag refers to a, a baby in a bag that's being thrown around until it's dead some really fucked up shit well for some reason the writers or the director of this episode decided to set up this scene in a ridiculous fashion you have an orchestral score in the background that's over the top and in your face to the point where it's laughable, you have this really annoying repetition of cat in a bag, cat in a bag, cat in a bag, cat in a bag. And I think it's supposed to be uh, an instance of things being unsettling or unnerving because it's chaotic. But the way that it's set up, the way that it's edited, the way that the music is, it comes across as ridiculous. 
And that's the worst kind of tone that you want for a serious scene like that. The score should have been more subdued, or if it was going to be there, it should have been more unsettling, more unnerving, maybe an atonal score or something. And if that way, when you have the repetitive nature of the woman saying, can I bang, can I bang, then it would actually come across as disturbing and really provide the tone that you want. Instead, the way that it's set up, it's ridiculous, and you're dealing with something incredibly messed up and such a really key moment in terms of the trauma that the Emmerings are dealing with. And you're handling it in a way that's like a fucking car crash. So yeah, I don't like that. Uh, and honestly, any scene with the woman is just woefully bad because the way that it's set up is just so over the top in terms of her villainy like you would expect her to start cackling like the wicked witch of the west and fly away on a fucking broom like it's that bad they really should have been more subtle with this character uh and it th that's not what happened here for a show that takes so many things so seriously, deals with a lot of serious issues like racism and and uh, depression and grief and anxiety and all of these things, to have these moments where they trivialize racism by making it just the the work of the devil and not the work of man or the work of society. No, the devil did it. Uh, or having these moments like Cat in the Bag where it's just over the top to the point where it comes across as zany. And then you have this serious lack of balance that just becomes really uh, dull and boring after a while. Because what I mean by that is everyone in Compton is a racist or a piece of shit. And that's the la lack of balance I'm talking about. This message that white people are awful, white people are racist. Like, anyone that you think might be on their side, other than, like, maybe this, the guy who runs a convenience store or a general store, turns out to also be a scumbag. Or turns out to be a evil ghost that's trying to uh, manipulate them and trying to kill them. It, it just gets to the point where it's just too much. It's it's just one-sided. And also, speaking of one-sided, this message of white people are awful. White people were racist and they were terrible uh, back in the 50s and they still are terrible today. It's something that, yes, it is, it is definitely a message that I hear loud and clear. But it's also a message at this point, at least with the way that this series is saying it, it's one that... I've heard countless times already. This series, at times, it's like someone is on top of a rooftop with a megaphone and just yelling this message of white people suck, white people are racists, and it's not providing a new perspective. It's not providing a new spin on things, like something uh, like Us or Get Out or Bad Hair. At least bad hair, even though it wasn't that great, it provided a unique perspective on racism and uh, culture and society that I didn't see much of. The the take on black hair and how uh, black women and black people are discriminated against based on their hair and how they are pressured to be more white in terms of straightening their hair and and so on. That's something that I didn't really see as much of in media. But with this, it's just the same message. And after a while, it just gets really uh, dull and honestly starts to fall on deaf ears. And that's the worst thing you, that you really want when it comes to this kind of serious issue. And it also comes down to how much they trivialize it. I mean, they turn racism into a plot point into an excuse for the 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 reverend as to why he's evil and 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 they use racism in that way where the devil just uses it and to manipulate the guy and makes him racist <laughs> like i i mean so yeah it's just really 
uh, not that well handled. And then you have this very exploitative vibe that's honestly really nasty that involves the violence. And I understand why they're doing that to showcase how violent racism is and and was. But it's handled in a way that does. It feels like trauma porn. A lot of people have pointed that out. And I agree with it wholeheartedly. Cat in a bag. The scene where the black couple get their eyes burned out. It just feels like it's unnecessary levels of violence. And it just feels like it's there for shock value. And nothing else. And then you have the ending of this series. Which doesn't even have a light at the end of the tunnel. There's not even a glimmer of hope. Everything is hopeless. The Emery family, after everything that they've went through, they vanquished their inner demons. They've got a new perspective on life. They walk outside the door and they're ready to face whatever is going to come at them head on and with their head, he heads held high. And the music in the background is trying to make this seem like it's a moment of strength and a moment of power. And, and when you think about it for any length of time, you realize that this, this family is fucked. They are screwed with no lube. This is the 1950s. Uh, they have already committed crimes. So uh, the mother and father are probably going to go to jail or they're going to get lynched by the mob outside uh the older daughter probably gonna go to jail too might also probably if if the mother and father get lynched she's probably gonna get lynched too uh the the little girl probably gonna get sent to foster care and at worst also fucking killed and i understand yes it's realistic when it comes to what they did and what they were manipulated into doing by these outside forces and the forces of society but it's something that at this point because of how heavy the show is it's not needed you don't need an ending where everything is so bleak and hopeless for this family it would have been a more powerful message if there was some semblance of hope that they might be able to make it out together and not together in a body bag and I don't know about you, I don't really view this as that strong. It's perceived strength. Oh, I'm going to face everything head on with my head held high. But there's never a moment of genuine victory. It's just something that's a personal victory for this family. But when it comes to an overall victory, that's not really there in this series. So it doesn't really feel like your time was that justified when it comes to 10 episodes of watching this series only for it to end in a way where they are more than likely going to be screwed. And I don't know about you, I would get tired of that. This idea that I, I no matter what, you will always be discriminated, you will always ne you will never get ahead. There's never a light at the end of the tunnel. I would think that a lot of African Americans, I'm not going to speak for all of them because it's not my place, but I would think that a lot of them who watch this series would look at this and be like, that's bullshit. That's fucking bullshit. This idea that uh, everything is hopeless, everything is fucked, uh, and we have no light at the end of the tunnel. I mean... I do. I think that that would be something that a lot of African American audiences would not be a fan of. And it just makes you think like, what was the point of the series at the end of the day to lecture about uh, race politics in ways that aren't really as compelling or as interesting or as intriguing as other forms of media? Uh, what really was the point of this show? If, if nothing really gets resolved other than they have a personal triumph over their personal demons, they triumph over grief, they triumph over uh, uh, a lot of their uh, issues psychologically and, and within the family, and they reunite and they get back together only to face a mob outside and more than likely going to wind up in disaster. So... 
that all also leads to the show being horribly paced because once you really get an idea of where this is going, it, there's just no, there's not much of an investment in things. Oh, I want to see how much more worse it's going to get. Like, I, I, I don't really see how that's really something that works for a 10 episode long series. I'm not saying that it needed to be sugar coated and cotton candy in terms of the ending. Uh, I'm fine with it being dark because that fits the tone. But some kind of hope, something would have been really beneficial and really would have helped this series. But without any whatsoever, it just feels like it was a waste of time. That's my thoughts on them. As you can see, I'm not a fan of the show. I think it's a below average series because of the writing, mainly. And it feels like it wasted the performances and the effort of this cast. I did ultimately, at the end of the day, grow to like and really uh, uh, care for the Emery family. That's why the ending is so upsetting. It's like they couldn't get some kind of hope after everything that they went through, like, I think that would be a much more inspiring message that despite everything, despite having forces on both sides trying to tear you apart, you can, you can still be strong and you could still be together and there's still hope. But instead, the message is you're hopeless. It doesn't matter what you do. And that's just fucked up. Uh, but anyway, thank you for watching uh, my thoughts on them. And as always, I'll see you later. See ya.